Um, Diana Bocarejo comes to us from um, the Universidad del Rosario, one of the oldest, if not perhaps the oldest, um, university in the continent of in this continent world, actually. Certainly older than anything. San Martin? Yeah, maybe second. <laughs> that is maybe. Second. We were among the oldest uh, on the continent. Top there's two. there's probably an older one on the islands. But anyway, so she comes um, uh, she has been working in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is a gigantic mountain that rises some 20,000 uh, feet above sea level right next to the Caribbean Sea. And she's going to talk to us about alternatives, approaches to forced eradication, state formation, sovereignty, and legal subjects in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Liliana, uh, especially for inviting me here. And the title of my presentation is Ecosocial Policies, Eradication, Development, and the War on Drugs. And uh, in this short presentation, I will try to engage the topic of the symposium by showing how, in order to grasp both the environmental and social practices and the cost of drug production and of the war on drugs, we need to understand the articulation of very different things that are within but that go also beyond the drug trade. One uh, of the issues, one of the variables, is actually state practices uh, the relationship between state institutions and local inhabitants, the economic practices and the actors involved, the expectations regarding labor and development, and finally, the intricate exercises of corruption and violence. Uh, we all know that the ruins of drug trafficking and those of the war on drugs uh, in Colombia are painfully present around the contemporary social, environmental and political landscape. Paradoxically, and this is what I'm interested in studying, such ruins have been transformed, government after another, into a form of state formation, deemed capable of building from institutional ashes new discourses or practices of local governance. We might call this ingenuity, maybe so, uh, but what is interesting is that instead of judging the state by its failure, uh, we need to ask what kind of local practices of stateness are being shaped within the politics of the war on drugs. For, ist for instance, to what extent the coupling of the war on drugs with development programs may serve to create new relationships between marginalized local populations and local state institutions uh, and national local state institutions, or how politics of illegal crop substitution have been capable or not to redefine local social inequities or intricate practices of violence. And here uh, I want to engage these questions by presenting the case of Familia Guardabosques, Ranger Families or Warden Families, which is an important alternative program to forced eradication in Colombia that has been effected in national parks as well as uh, in many other areas of environmental conservation. The arguments that I'm presenting today are, an are part of an ongoing research that I started a few years ago with some funding from the SSRC program on drug security and democracy, and I focus in studying the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta, which is there in gray, in green. And um, I was particularly interested in following the processes and in comparing the middle areas of the Sierra Nevada and the lower areas of the Sierra Nevada. This is important because you find very different kind of economic practices and social practices uh, across the mountain. And um, what I did methodologically was to carry out more than 100 interviews in, in more than 10 specific uh, little pueblos around the Sierra and to carry out ethnographic analysis also in those areas. Uh, there are a few ideas and a few arguments that I would like to stress today. 
First, that the war on drugs has provided different languages of local governance. This is going to make a variation within and across the Colombian landscape. And drug production and the war on drugs became powerful mechanisms for shaping ideas about legal subjectivity, economy, and politics in the global era. Uh, the second idea is that the war on drugs in Colombia has articulated in very specific ways with development. And let us remember that development is one of the main rhetorics of state formation in Colombia and in many other third world countries. Um, so, and in particular for the case of Familias Guardaosque, what I was very surprised to find was this engagement by local inhabitants in believing that Familias Guardaosque was probably one of the only options they had to stay within the territory and uh, to believe that actually a small peasantry may be maintained in the area. Uh, if we want to understand something about the environment that's socially constituted, I think there's a lot of work to do in terms of actually analyzing the policies of state and non-state institutions, trying to follow also the different understandings of nature and the access to natural resources, in particular land use and land tenure. And finally, I want to stress the, 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 the crucial point of the political context. And here I, um, I really want to have a, a, a broad understanding of politics in terms of not only taking into account elections, but also local elites, corruption, issues of sovereignty associated with armed groups. Uh, all this kind of uh, political landscape is going to be crucial for understanding what is happening with drug production and with the war on drugs. Um, so let's start with the first idea, the idea of state formation. So uh, four issues, I believe, related to drug production and to the war on drugs need to be understood as coming together to get at local processes of state formation. Both drug production and the war on drugs are addressed at the same time as objects to blame, windows of, of opportunity of defining and windows of opportunity and ways of defining and reading the past and processes that shape new forms of agency and subjectivity. What I refer to the idea of something to blame is that illegal drug production, distribution and consumption have been considered the cause of a great number of contemporary evils, such as violence against uh, towards the individual and communities, economic and political instability, and the consolidation of strong mafias that may contest, interfere, or at least threaten the very notion of a state. However, the war on drugs is in itself a target of blame as well. In particular, I am referring here to the mechanisms of aerial glyphosate spraying used to eradicate illegal crop cultivation, what Moreno uh, has called chemical statecraft. The history of drugs has also become a potent way of reading the past. It has become what authors like Graeber and many other authors called a bridge across time that serves to explain the complex way, ways in which historicity is produced for local inhabitants. The way people talk about the past shows intricate contradictions between a violent past that coexists with the glorious past of economic prosperity and social organization, in this case in particular, led by the paramilitary boss of the area. I will come back to this point. The idea of the window of opportunity relates to the fact that a drug production has also been addressed as a window of opportunity to find work, to have access to natural resources, and uh, mainly through extortion or clientelistic relations. And as an example, for ex uh, Hernán Giraldo, who was the patron, the, the, the paramilitary drug leader of the area, used to grant permission to occupy land, to organize health brigades, to ensure the maintenance of roads, and he was also the responsible of what local inhabitants called as an ethic of distribution. So this is highly complex and, and disturbing also. Um, in turn, Familias Guardabosques, the alternative program of illegal drug eradication, has offered the local population state money, allocations, technical formation on cacao, coffee and tourism, and a powerful language of inclusion uh, and of being seen as legal citizens. These different ways of, re of reading drug production and the war on drugs become crucial ways of defining state effects, that is, for example, class classifying citizens and communities, shaping a legible language of governance, or defining the de facto spatial jurisdictions and boundaries of the area. All of these uh, ideas that I just presented 
contrasts with the pervasive rhetoric in Latin America about the absence of the state. And as an example, I just wanted to use a quote uh, of Fernand Brodel, used by James Scott in his last book, in which actually Scott states, um, civilization cannot climb uh, hills. We'll see. <laughs> um, so Scott actually states, quote, the hills are not simply a space of political resistance, but also a zone of cultural refusal. This cult cultural chasm between the mountains and the plains has been claimed as something of a historical constant, at least in Europe. And these ideas, of course, may very well apply to the Sierra Nevada uh, Santa Marta, the highest mountain that rises from sea level and goes to snow caps. And this is actually something really present in day-to-day -day, um, um, speech. But actually, within the 21st century, what is interesting is that even if the state still do not climb mountains, it can fly <laughs> to the top of the mountains to spray crops, an activity that entails both a practical and symbolic way of making places and people legible. So, but beyond this sarcastic image, I would like to make a more nuanced argument. So, in spite of the pervasiveness of the ideas about the state, the absence of the state, there are at least two problems or clarifications to be made when referring to this idea. The first is that it usually serves as an excuse not to study the actual practices and discourses of different state and non-state institutions that work with the government's endorsement, precarious though their actions may appear, and not so precarious when fumigating thousands of land hectares. And second, the rhetoric about the absence of the state goes well beyond the simple idea that people have completely forgotten about the state. We ought to acknowledge how this image builds a certain forms of marginality and forms of engagement with the state. So my claim here is that drug production, as well as the critique of the war on drugs, provides a language of non-state present, presence that in fact hides the different manners in which the state is actually present and being formed locally in those areas, as well as the intricate manner in which the state is still desired and longed for. I will talk a little bit more now about Familias Guardabosques. Um, so Familias Guardabosques uh, was a program of uh, illegal, uh, an alternative program for um, forced um, eradication. And uh, there was some interesting things regarding Familias Guardabosques. The first one is that it ensured a non aerial fumigation. And this in the area was an ama a huge accomplishment. So uh, it was a program developed by Exxon Social, which was an institution that is part of the president's office. The, the program negotiated directly with the communities who voluntarily signed a contract stating they cannot cultivate or work in illegal crop production and trafficking. By becoming involved in the program, communities were able to ensure the non-fumigation of the coca growing areas. The second important uh, point is that this form of negotiation and the distribution of monetary incentives how, has opened an important window of trust and brought the state closer to communities. But what I wanted to mention here is that there's still a lot of lack of trust of local authorities. Uh, I will explain this a little bit um, um, later, but the problem was that Familias Guardabosques decided to engage with local populations and to surpass and not engage with uh, local state institutions. Um, the third important point is that people believe and people are immersed in really complex um, context of local corruption and violence, and they believe that Familias Guardabosques was one of the few programs that was able to work out the local institutions, not working with them, but at least getting something done. And, uh, and what is kind of complicated, of course, is that um, Hernán Giraldo was one of the, the, the persons who facilitated the coming together of this program in the Sierra Nevada. And uh, even he was um, called to intervene to oblige beneficiaries of the program to save money. They were supposed to save following the program's demand in one local co-op that actually went bankrupt. So he was the one who was able to tell the people, you have to save some money and you have to put the money here. Unfortunately, what happened is that the, the co-op, the local co-op actually like, went bankrupt and it was a total disaster. Um, and finally, 
uh, one of the main objectives of the program is not only to eradicate illegal crop cultivation, but also to generate the, necess the necessary incentives for better or new economic activities. Uh, the monetary inc incentives, so, so that you get a, like a good view of the, the program, amounts to $150 per month per family for three years. All right. uh, there are many concerns about that kind of, uh, of, of, of policy. Uh, the first one is, as I mentioned, the intricate connections between anti-drug policy policies and violence. The second is the role of local institutions in anti-growth policies because the, the program is not sustainable. So after this three-year um, process and project being carried out, none of the local institutions have decided to take the project or to invest in the project. So it's almost kind of gone. Uh, third, the quest for development and the problem of short-term strategies. Many people in Colombia working on development have noticed the problem uh, that these kind of, of projects have because they are supposed to work with a window of two years or three years and they are never like a project of cacao, a project of, co of coffee, it's not going to work in two or three years. And uh, the problem of land tenure is really crucial. Um, to be able to sign in the Familias Guardabosques projects, you were supposed to have uh, something that we call the compraventa, which is actually not a title of the land. And most of the projects right now are in a land that people do not own. So nobody knows what's, what's going to happen with, with those projects, actually. And finally, I was uh, kind of interested in studying the reproduction of social differences in the area, because there were people who had access to Familias Guardabosques and many other families who didn't. So what is happening like uh, in this particular area in terms of the reproduction of social differences uh, and distances between people? And uh, so what is happening with the environment and, and, and uh, how to understand the discourses of the environment in this particular area? And what I want to point out is that uh, most of the discourses in these areas move between two extremes. So there's one extreme, which is the National Parks Office and many environmental friendly people who state small peasants shouldn't be living around those areas. They should, they, they, I mean, so, so this is what some authors in geography have called violent environments. The idea that uh, there's a lot of land dispossessions of peasants because they're not supposed to live there or to use those areas. And the other ex extreme is the landscape of big, big scale development projects, which is also present in the area. Huge agricultural projects of palm oil and banana plantations, for example, and also tourist corporations. Uh, getting to the area. So what is ha happening with peasant small landholders? They don't have kind of a, a space between these two uh, discourses. And precisely what Familias Guardabosques was able to grant is the idea that they were able to stay within like, like small peasant uh, holders. And um, now what I want to develop is this idea of a moral economy in the 21st century. I, I, I'm not going to develop the concept right now, but if you're interested, we can discuss it later. But um, what it was interesting is to follow was this language of hope. What is happening with these peasant smallholders? So the first thing is that uh, there was a lot of talk about visibility and inclusion. So Familias Guardabosques shares with many other programs the strong power of being seen the affective idea of being included. Um, we might say, and this is something kind of complicated, these are all the certificates that people all over the mountain actually uh, keep in their houses. So these are people ha that actually didn't go to school, but for them, these are their diplomas, and they really cherish them and they, they take care of them. So we might, we might say that all these certificates have not meant a crucial improvement of people's living condition and income, yes. We might say that Familias Guardabosques is a technique of power that reproduces all the inequalities in the area. We might even argue that short-term programs, and many policy experts have pointed out, are deemed to failure. We might say, as I, ha as I have strongly argued before, that these programs are not sustainable socially, economically, and politically. And all these statements are actually right. But beyond the program itself, what interests me are the moments of hope 
built by local marginalized inhabitants that build the desire for a moral economy that is not an innocent and romantic way of understanding the current political and economic context. I was really surprised because they talk about a transnational commonality. So these are peasants immersed into the fair trade and responsible consumption and tourism that it's uh, like a movement all over the world. And they believe they're part of that kind of, 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 of trend. And they believe there's still like a small wind of opportunity for them to stay in the Sierra and to have a small production and still get a lot of people mainly from abroad or mainly from the main city in Colombia who kind of understand their notions of a, of a kind of a of a good way of being a capitalist and entrepreneur. There's a lot of talk about entrepreneur and entrepreneurship between these peasants, actually. And um, finally, and this is how I'm just going to close this presentation, if I want to understand what is happening with drug production and the war on drugs, I really need to take into consideration what is happening to politics in many local areas in Colombia. And this is just one example. Uh, this is what I call the personification of power and redemptive politics in the area. So politics, um, even if people recognize that when Hernán Giraldo was there, uh, they had to vote for X or X. There was no real choice of election. Um, they still had uh, their own strong dynamics of clientelism. On the one hand, people explain the pervasive local political culture, including practices of corruption and ways of negotiating with politicians as unchangeable. Those highly valuable political figures are able to work within the system, not drastically changing it, but at least getting things done since they know how to deal with violence and corruption. I'm going to present just two ideas about corruption and clientelism in the area. The first one is that during elections, beyond the traditional seeking of long-term favors or political commitments, communities actually attempt to get something before the election itself, such as power transformers, construction materials, soccer uniforms, etc. As one local inhabitant told me, with the town councillor, we got the suspended bridge on that side of the town and other things for out of the field. Another local leader told me, well, it is sad, but it is what happens. We asked the candidate, what do you have? What are you going to give me and I vote for you? Are you going to pay for my vote? Are you going to bring any benefits for the community, be it a power transformer or a machine for the road? The second example is that people expect local authorities to rob. They really expect it is going to happen, but at least to leave something done. Robe, pero robe bien. Rob, but rob nicely. Leave something behind. This is kind of the political culture of the area. And there are very uh, violent and pervasive ideas, such as this expert in cacao who actually works in Familias Guardabosques. And during the interview, and I kind of went with him to the field, and all the time he was saying, you know, people only move if someone puts a gun to their head or if there's money. And this is kind of the representative work in cacao. Um, and what it was very interesting, you know, the, the kind of, um, oral histories that I did along the Sierra Nevada was that there were only a few powerful subjects believed to have enough power to rule, navigate, or run the flows of goods and people along the Sierra. And this idea and, is embodied in only two people. So you have Hernán Giraldo, um, the paramilitary commander, and the former president Uribe. So however, Hernán Giraldo, however violent their methods may have been, local communities recall the order paramilitary groups were able to bring to the area with nostalgia, since state, the state has never been capable of achieving anything comparable. Uh, this is even more remarkable given the fact that Hernán Giraldo actually uh, was, um, he was, he entered into this process of demobilization and he's extradited here, he's here in the US since 2009, but the paradox lies in the contrasting images of the dominance of Giraldo. So on the one hand, there is a general recognition that he was the ruling force of the area. He was known as the patron, and he decided who lived and who died. People recount, in fact, the atrocities he committed, including his taste for young virgin girls, which is something that has been studied in the Comisión de, de Reparación y Reconciliación. And on the other hand, the patron he w was capable of delivering what the state did not. 
Uh, he was capable of shaping this idea of a kind of a moral economy, distributing good, access to work, access to land and to natural resources. Um, as, as one of the quotations I just wrote here uh, states, he liked hearing people's comments and he sent his people to chat with them or to tell them to come and talk to him. We understood each other well, he was very helpful, he helped my, with family issues. If someone did not have money, he helped him. He became one like, he earned the appreciation of the communities, he's very well remembered. We hold him in high esteem. And this is from a person whose brother was actually killed. Right. So, uh, yes. So there's all the time these contrasting images with Giraldo, which is really disturbing. And, um, and of course Uribe, well, former uh, President Uribe was an extremely popular figure during his eight years of government. His democratic security program had important results for entrepreneurs, tourism, mining, and agricultural production. And uh, um, one, something that was studied actually by Fernan Gonzalez is that Uribe was able to shape the presidential government that was capable of breaking down traditional partisan loyalties uh, in local areas, such as in the Sierra. So this is kind of interesting. What is uh, uh, interesting also is that even if people acknowledge Uribe... Answer, answer. With video or without no, video? He's gonna call. He's yes, gonna no. talk. Okay, let's take the video. Out. How? Sleep away, too boy. Yeah. <laughs> he looks sick. Hello. I'm almost done. I'm just. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Do you have a microphone? Yeah, we have. We Yo have. Escucho. Okay, let me turn his mic. Our microphone. Uh, apaga tu micrófono. <laughs> Turned off his mic. Yeah. Okay. okay, we have him now. Oh, we have him there. It's yeah. fine. It's okay. I'm gonna be done in this two is seconds. This so very weird. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to mention that uh, one of the complicated things is that people still believe there's going to be another kind of patron figure. Nobody knows what is going to happen right now. The 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 political situation is really messy and complicated again in the area, and this is not working. Oh, because of his call. Let me deal with it. How about you ju if you just he click here? Very well, though, with those other patrones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, I did. Okay, this is the last one. So this is um, last December, actually, people's fears became reality because after the uh, paramilitary leader was killed from the Urabeños group, Santa Marta, which is the nearest city of the Sierra, completely collapsed for four days. And this is actually President Santos telling people, we're going to be okay, everything's going to be okay, please reopen your businesses, everything's fine. And of course, nothing was fine. Anyhow. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to finish now. <laughs> So going back to my argument, I was particularly intrigued by the similar adjectives and descriptions used by local communities to talk about Giraldo and Uribe in the same manner. Um, and uh, in, anyways, as a way of concluding, I would um, kind of only stress that it is within all these broad contexts and all these broad articulations that we kind uh, that we ought to understand the reach and the effects both of drug production and on the war on drugs, which in a way, as I stated at the first uh, part of this uh, presentation, goes well beyond the numbers of hectares eradicated. So if that's going to be the main variable and that's going to be the only uh, variable to take into account, this is not even half of the story. So, so I just wanted to present all this kind of messy story so that you see all the different articulations and how the war on drugs and drug production is entangled within very local realities, uh, social, environmental, and political realities in this particular area of Colombia. Thank you.